Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Junkyard Digs. I'm your host, Kevin, and this is my buddy Dalton from Pole Barn Garage. And today, we dive back into the 71 satellite in an attempt to buff out all the paint and then dig to the engine and make this thing good once again. Hopefully, better than it's ever been. Let's get started. If you guys missed the first episode, this is the 71 satellite I bought off Facebook Marketplace and then discovered that it actually originated from my hometown in North Iowa. Now we're on a war path to put a cam, headers, four barrel intake, all the goodies in the engine bay, clean the outside up and drive it all the way back up to the previous owner up in Wisconsin. Plus maybe go drag racing somewhere in there. I think step one for us is actually going to ironically be, uh, oh, you want to do dents first? I get rid of the dent. You can't pause. That? You can polish your dent. <laughs> Just don't scratch my dents. <laughs> this isn't kinked. You know, sometimes a dent gets kinked, but you're not going to be able to pop it out like this. And thankfully, all Mopars are made out of Budweiser beer cans, and uh, yeah, it'll come right out, actually. If we could just get a little pressure on the back side of it, it'll pop like a soda can, pop it right out. You can kind of see where I've got the bar. Not the sharp side. Not the sharp side. Use the round side. Paintless dent removal. Oop, there went some of it. Oh, oh look at that. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. This thing's gonna be back in orbit in no time. Damn right. Damn. Eat your heart out, chip foos. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why I knew we should bring you, because I don't care quite enough to get really specific. <laughs> I knew my dad would be too good. Like, I need the hammer guy that I can hit with beer. <laughs> the exhaust pipe and crowbar guy. <laughs> that might be as good as it gets. All right, what's the next dent? All right, passenger door does yeah. have a bit of an issue. There we go. Okay, so we need to do this without breaking the glass. Numbers matching Mopar glass. Yeah, that window is only for red cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's... there's something dead in there. What we have here is a football that's flat. The thing about a flat football is when you put air in it, it gets bigger, right? And wow. so... <laughs> Science. So, if we put it in here, air up football, pop dent. And we got a various size range of footballs. A couple footballs, a basketball. And of course, to top it all off, the $9. The worst air pump they have. Bicycle air pump. <laughs> Help. Oh, it's leaking. I was gonna say, I hear, I hear air leaking. Hang on. Okay. You broke our nine dollar pump. I did not break that. Snapped it clean off. <laughs> get the glue. I'll get the air compressor. We'll just blow it into it. Okay. How about that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, we're getting it done this now. This is gonna work now. <laughs> Well, <laughs> shot the needle out. I think what obscure metric thread is this thing? China 12. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap, it worked! Do I need to do more or is that good? I'd go a little more. It's, we need to move it up next. We might have to change to the uh, size 2 football. <laughs> Oh, is this size one? That's size one. It's kind of like wire. Uh, a number one football is a, is bigger. And uh, then we have, of course, the SAE size six basketball. So <laughs> <laughs> easy now. Okay, right there. A little, a little more. Just touching the glass. All right, go ahead. Okay, I'll run this. Okay. There you go. It's coming. Oh, wow! We popped the football, but it got the dent out. <laughs> wow! Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is how you press dents out for, what, $9.88? $9. And it self deflates. That was awesome. That's cool. All right, step one before we really start polishing everything, hit this with some de-germ to take the super crusty upper layer to clean off the car. Ready, go. Time 60, warp speed. Wow, 
That's already a ten shades darker red. All right, let's get the polish in. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. We've all been. <laughs> yeah, as you can tell, it's been a little bit since I've. Uh... <laughs> oh, wow. oh no! There's enough to do the whole roof. We've definitely all been there. Oh, hang on, there's rust or what something. What is that? Did it come off of the film? Oh, that. You, know, you know what? Just rub it. Yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> It's always good to like test first on it's top in the center not in the middle of the <laughs> roof generally <laughs> look how much that metal slices budweiser beer cans yeah it's even red <laughs> that's coming out pretty damn good starting to see all the dents yeah, it looks great. <laughs> it's more red than it was. It is more red. Actually, it is red. I mean, it really wasn't even red. No, it's again for, <laughs> for a reminder. That's the hood. This is the car. <laughs> so, the lacquer checking in here is this is. I believe lacquer paint sprayed right over the original acrylic enamel because lacquer paint is cheap. That's what a shop would have used back in the day, like a real budget shop. But what happens is with the way lacquer coatings dry is when you spray them on, they stay wet. The way they dry is the lacquer evaporates out of the coating and then it's dry to the touch, right? But that inherently leaves pores in the surface. And then you end up with checks and cracks and stuff, especially if you put it over something that is chemically colder than it. Then you've not only that, you've melted the surface under it. It's trying to come through and it's no good. I mean, that's probably not exactly it, but that's how I understand it. Like a urethane paint, like modern urethanes, modern primer urethanes, those are two part. So they have a hardener in them. And when you mix them, you'll mix them four to one. It'll be one part hardener. That hardener cures it. It doesn't need to evaporate. It doesn't need to oh. air off. It just needs to chemically hardens. It chemically like hardens itself. JB well it's like a shell. Paint. Yeah. Okay. And so it's adhered and then hardens itself. That's how all most modern paints are. Interesting. Yeah, if you guys didn't know, Dalton's actually not totally the idiot he plays. <laughs> 50-50. He's just uh, maybe just good at paint. Yeah, I've done some. <laughs> Subscribe to Pole Barn Garage for more science. Call me Bill Nye. <laughs> Holy shit! Holy shit! What? It's been a long time. Oh God, I'm a bitch. It's been a long time, mate. Oh, it has been way too long. Real quick, do you have a place where you can charge me pounds? Like, yeah. This, nothing's changed. I called you with one, one bloody percent. This is all too nostalgic. The Thunderhead and Kevin once again, and a uh, 318 in a 70s, early 70s satellite with a four barrel and two barrel. This one somehow looks slightly worse, like en <laughs> engine wise. Like it was, Yeah. I would say it was in a more humid environment, but the last one literally sat in a swamp. It so. was a junk. Well, How are you? Not What's new? Bad. I moved. So, you did. so right now I'm like 15 minutes away from you instead of 45 to an hour. Which, if you're 45 to an hour in Iowa, might as well not exist. You might as well be like three yeah, hours. Yeah, I basically haven't seen Luke since he moved. We saw each other at Power Tour each year, and good guys. With that being said, like Luke just mentioned, he is moving closer, which means we should hopefully be able to do a whole bunch more collaborations again. I am really excited about that. Yeah, it'd be a good time. Also, uh, Dalton, Luke, Luke, Dalton. Hello, sir. Howdy. I like your car out there. Thank is you. Is that a 73? It is. All right, back to polishing. Well, uh, there's the quarter panel. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I don't think I've ever seen paint so bad. Let's see if I get the camera. Oh, yeah, there we go. Check that out. That's just the whole thing. But don't zoom the microscope on it. Then they're going to know. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. Yeah, it's, it's not great. Imagine it driving by you. Yeah, like this. Let's emulate that. 
<laughs> Look how red it was. That was oh. great. <laughs> was that a Roadrunner? Also, while we're here, we've noticed something. There's a decal right here, and it says Satellite Sebring. And the reason I know that is because we looked at some original photos I got of the car. I'll show them right now. This right here is the day it was brought home. And this right here is sometime after that when he put some mismatching rims on it, which looked pretty badass. So yeah, this is a Satellite Sebring, which was a little higher trim model. We need it. It's got compound all over. You know, we need oh, to. We gotta wash gotta the take whole a car. toothbrush. <laughs> You know, clean it all up. It's wet sand and repaint, you know. Yeah, and then cut this quarter panel off. Yep, yep. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Barrett Jackson. This oh, time I... on graveyard cars. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I forgot to step the eight pounds of filler, but you beat me there. <laughs> Slurp. <laughs> Interesting choice of noise. <laughs> Swirl remover. It's key. Well, Dalton, I have to say, it looks like shit, but it looks great. It's not bad. I mean, it's red. This is what you call a 1060 paint job. 10 feet, 60 miles an hour. She's cleaned up a lot, though. This looks incredible. Especially when you compare it to the hood we forgot about. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's that versus that well with that uh we've got some revival stuff to do tomorrow yeah. so keep an eye out on pole wine garage's channel for some more stuff that is not related to this car it is time to move into the brakes and the engine and get this thing up and running thank you Dalton. that's all you yes it is enjoy <laughs> with all that make sure you subscribe to pole wine garage on youtube I think we already did the handshake on camera. There's two of them now. Whatever. Okay. Good. This is better? Goodbye now. Okay, bye. Good morning, folks. Welcome to the second day of episode two. This morning, I pulled the car out in an attempt to turn it around and drain the coolant in preparations for getting the motor work done. Well, I guess if you guys ever get a car, the top radiator hose has been off for a while. Assume the entire inside of the radiator is a mouse nest. This was clean concrete when I started. Look at all the stuff that's come out of this. Look at the mouse nest piles. Those are big piles. Look at that. So what I've got going on, the garden hose into the bypass tube. The lower radiator hose is on. The upper radiator hose is off. Right now I've been switching between covering this and letting it gurgle out of there. And it's just all sorts of crap. See it all coming out of there? Flex of junk and so, oh Jesus, <laughs> yeah that. <laughs> and once that's done bubbling each time, let it run for a sec, and then remove this. And I get another one out of this end over and over. It's like the tenth time now. I guess I'll keep at this for a little while, and once that's done, I'll push her in and start working on that motor. All right, the satellite is in the lift bay. It's looking great, so great in fact that I am facing a dilemma. <laughs> I took some time with a scrub brush and some soap, cleaned up the interior. It looks incredible. It doesn't even stink anymore. I mean, look at look at that door over there. Just awesome. The actual panels themselves that cover that, eh, we'll see. But this thing has the potential to turn out way better than I had ever anticipated. And with that being said, we kind of have this underneath the hood still. Like, really clean car, gonna have some nice new rims and tires. <laughs> Might as well go all out, pull this drive line, freshen it up with new gaskets and paint, and then get her back in here. Well, it took me two hours instead of one, but here we are. Motor's coming out, nothing too weird. Probably would have been a little easier to take the whole cross member out instead of trying to float the tail over it, but all in all, pretty easy engine removal right here. By the way, whoever sent Luke and I this in the mail, thank you very much. That thing's pretty nice. Who knew technology, you know? Perfect. There we go. The engine is out and ready for a date with a pressure washer, a box of Summit goodies, and hopefully a can of spray paint. Let's get this washed up, separated, and put on an engine stand. All right, scrub a dub. Today we're using the Gunk original engine degreaser. This stuff works good. Uh, Zep, 
works good. They got a good degreaser. I know you can buy it at Menards. And O'Reilly's actually has their own brand of degreaser that looks, unfortunately, identical to the brake clean. Oh, that's not uh, that's not brake cleaner. Don't crank it. This is engine degreaser. Oh shit! <laughs> oh no! Spray this on. Soak everything down. Let it sit and start washing. all washed up the transmission has been removed I got this up in an engine stand side note it is totally okay to buy the Harbor Freight engine stands throw all the hardware away immediately and I mean immediately the hardware on honestly any of the cheap engine stands is usually like grade 5 at best and I don't know how many times I put a small block Ford on here like the bottom half the lower end of a small block Ford and watch the whole thing just droop as I let all the weight off the engine hoist and just bend the little bolts into bananas. Throw it all away, go down to the store, get some grade eight bolts with some grade eight washers and replace all the hardware that holds the motor to the back, both the ones that go into the block and the hardware that goes into the plate that holds the little slides. Now that that's out of the way, let's dig into this 318 and start breaking off water pump bolts. Hey, check this out. I got a 1994 date code on the uh, fuel pump which aligns with the oil and everything we saw in the car. So definitely late 90s is the last time this was driven. Fuel pump. Good bolt. Mmm, look at that. Brand new Boltster. If you haven't heard of these, these are a silicone bolt organizer mat. This is the original Boltster. They have a bunch of other designs as well. Check them out on Boltster.com. They are chemical resistant, heat resistant, and have a one year warranty and make organizing all your bolts that you take off your front drive accessories a breeze. Once again, check them out, bolster.com slash JYD, where you can get an exclusive discount for being a viewer of Junkyard Digs. If you're gonna break, please just break up by the head so I'm not extracting shit out of the block. And it's completely round. Well, you know what to say, can't be tight if it doesn't exist. Ta-da! Usually I take a picture of how these were, but I think I have one slash the camera's rolling, so a future Kevin, they go like this. Boink. Another great thing about these bolsters is if you got a few of them laying around and you don't get back to your project in any time soon, you can just pick this whole thing up, throw it on top of the motor, and put it in the back cabinet. That way, in a realistic three years when you get back to it, all your stuff is still there and organized. Jesus. Try not to gall up that timing cover because I do need him again, even though we have a new pump. I am really glad I took this out of the car. Oh, wait a minute. I got a new tool for this. You've seen the big ridiculous pliers, but what about the big ridiculous pry bar? You got a giant pry bar? I got a giant pry bar. Why didn't you inform me? <laughs> for obvious reasons. Holy shit. That was like grade three. Just... Boom, all right, that's all it takes. An hour to take your water pump off into the scrap bin. All right, that took way too long, but we finally got that off. If you look here, you'll see it was completely plugged here and completely plugged here, despite us trying to flush that out for like an hour. This thing is still solid, full of glycol and not moving any coolant which makes me suspect the block is probably still full of water. Yes, it is, look at this. Now that we've opened up some a spot for some air to get in, it's draining out of this frost plug. Interesting. Good thing we took this apart because it would have immediately went nuclear. If no one's ever taught you how to use a harmonic balancer puller before, this is the surefire method to not get this guy jammed down in there or strip all the threads out of it. Take your center crank bolt, Run them back in a few threads, leave a gap. See that gap? What I'm doing here is this bolt is in the crank. The harmonic balancer is on the outside of the crank. Often when you just shove this puller down into the harmonic balancer, it just hits the harmonic balancer itself. 
and you're pulling and pushing on the same piece of metal and you're never going to get anywhere. You're just going to rip the threads out of this. If you put that bolt in there, you are absolutely guaranteed to be pushing on the crank and pulling on the harmonic. So now... You can see right there, came all the way out to the bolt. Loosen them up a bit. Loosen your bolt some more. Now you want a few threads of engagement. You don't want to just do it on the last thread. It's going to gall everything up. Yeah, at this point, I should be close enough that I can take this off. Oh, whoa, there we go. All right, there you have it. Harmonic balancer is off. And our threads are still absolutely perfect. And all of our bolts didn't stress our tool too much. Didn't ruin the crank bolt. Everyone's good to go. Well, to say the least, that was fun. We got to our timing chain, which is junk. I, of course, I, I did break that getting it off, but regardless, it was junk. Our cover, as you can see, absolutely no water passage through there on one side. So that's quite interesting as well. I keep digging into this and get it ripped down. Oh my God, that's heavy. Why is that so heavy? I don't know how to do this with one hand. <laughs> That is like Ford FE heavy. <coughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> huh. Mm, yes. The PCB side is open. It, uh, it's seen better days. I'm getting, getting a lot of Ford wagon vibes right now from the 70 wagon I drove back from California. That one was worse though. Okay, so this is gonna look fake. <laughs> I just took this head off, or this valve cover off. Look at this. If that is what I think it is, yeah, that's a snap ring to an oil jug. Yeah, someone just dropped that in there like, nah, whatever. <laughs> just let it, let it eat. Good morning, folks. We are back with our dirty, grimy 318. I just dropped the oil. I'm gonna roll this over and take the pan off. I have a plan. This morning, I ordered a whole box of O'Reilly's foaming engine degreaser. And I soaked this down once already. I'm going to hit it a couple more times. And then just like the exterior of the motor, once the oil pan is off and also all soaked, I'm going to roll this whole shabab outside and hit it with a pressure washer once again to see if we can get these internals cleaned up. Now, I first thought that might seem sacrilege to spray a bunch of water inside the engine. But remember, this is going to be exposed on both sides. The bottom of the block will be open. The top of the block will be open. The only sealed chambers left are the cylinders. All I have to do is be somewhat cognizant of how much water I get in here or intentionally spray a bunch in and clean out these runners as well and then pull the plugs, flush all the water out of the cylinders and this should be just fine. All right, it is frigid cold out here so I don't want to bring the camera out. I just want to get this over with. I got our first pass done and let me tell you, this might be <laughs> a new favorite method. <laughs> Everything cleaned up incredibly well. There's water all over it so you can't see it. But that's basically all bare steel. There's no more grime, no more crap. I was able to blow in these water jackets here and get a bunch of rust out, blow through our drain plugs. Turns out this one was plugged. Took a lot of pressure, I got it cleaned out. Look at that. All right, our pressure washer cleanup is done. It came out really well. There's maybe a couple hard deposits that it might have missed. I just chipped them out with a screwdriver and vacuumed them up. And now she's good to go. Now I will mention it's probably not going to get into all the internal oil passages and stuff quite as well as an actual hot tank. And it's not going to give us the incredible finish that having the block blasted will do. But for what we're doing with this car, I am more than happy with the results. All that built up crap is gone and we're left with clean internals. With that being said, I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes with wet shoes and pants scraping gasket material. Literally my favorite things on the planet. By the way, if you've never heard of this, this right here is a super scraper. It's a steel bar, the rubber handle, and a carbide bit on the end. Best of all, made in Iowa. Maybe it's even available online by now. I know a couple years ago when I bought this, I don't think it was. This motor has been all too kind when it comes to broken studs. Both of these bolts are broken off and I can just screw them right out. That's incredible. No way. <laughs> well, I guess they were just seized in the timing cover, not actually in the block. Interesting. All right, she's all cleaned up. 
and taped off. It is time now to make it Chrysler Blue once again. Yes, paint. My enemy. <laughs> Something I've never been good at. You'll notice I have nice crisp tape lines around all this stuff. There is a trick to that. Put your tape down, get yourself a rubber mallet, and use either the rubber or the plastic side, whichever you prefer, and smack along all your tape lines and use the sharp machined edges to cut your tape. And then just come through with a little razor blade and help clean it up. Dad taught me that trick the last time I painted an engine, which was also blue. That would have been the F100 from years ago, one of the first videos on the channel. Scroll way back if you want to see skinny Kevin. Mm. By the way, if you're ever buying an engine off uh, Facebook Marketplace and it looks like this, where all the head bolts are the same color as the frost plugs, which are the same color as the block, there's a good chance someone just rattle can the whole thing. It's not actually rebuilt, especially when there's overspray all over the exhaust or the spark plugs or stuff that if they took two seconds, they wouldn't have painted that color. Beware of rattle can rebuilds. With that being said, I'm realizing that's exactly what this video is, is rattle can rebuild. Oh, yeah, the valve springs. That's the other thing that gets overspray. This Duplicolor enamel with the ceramic in it that I got from O'Reilly's is amazing. It flows really nice. It comes out of the can really nice. This is probably the best spray paint I've ever used. 10 out of 10, definitely recommend. And if you're confused on the colors, on the, yeah, right here. Chrysler Blue makes picking your colors really easy. It's hard to screw that one up. Two rocker shafts. There we go, factory lump stick, out. All right, it's the next morning, everything is dry. I've soaked our lifters for our cam all night. We are ready to stick this in. But before I do that, we have an announcement to make, the most exciting part of this entire video. Today's video is brought to you by Summit Racing. Literally the Summit Racing is helping us build this engine to put back in this car. A lot of new and old sponsors have come on board for this build to help absorb some of the costs so that hopefully in the end, if this guy still wants to buy his car back, it's got a third of the parts already replaced, good to go, and it won't hurt his checkbook as much, leaving him some more wiggle room for hopefully restoring it in the future, give this car the best chance it has at getting the attention it deserves. So a huge thanks to Summit Racing for sponsoring the cam, the headers, the distributor, ignition components, a whole bunch of other parts of this build and helping us put this car back on the road. Make sure you guys support the channel by supporting the companies that support the channel. Use the link down in the description below and buy your parts from summitracing.com. All right, let's get a camshaft in here. So today we're going to be installing the Edelbrock Performer uh, cam kit. Basically this is a comp cams 420 intake and exhaust at 253 duration. There's a part number 31-2177. Most importantly though, it comes with a giant cop cam sticker. That is two of them. Oh, hell yes. This is a cam that's designed to give us good low end performance on the street, which once again, we've said a thousand times on this channel, that's what you wanna focus on because along with low end performance is great drivability. Now this is a hydraulic roller camshaft, so we will have to do a break in on it, which is my favorite thing in the world. Not. There's so much go in this thing. Now the crucial part, not dinging it against every cam bearing on the way in. So far so good. That's where it gets difficult. Get in there. Yes. And we got good engagement with our oil pump. Sweet. Okay, that's that. We put a camshaft in an engine. The lifters are currently over there somewhere soaking in oil in a red solo cup. Once those look ready, I'll drop them all in place, clean up our push rods, reassemble everything, check our valve lash, make sure everything's good there, and we're ready to put an intake on. That was fun. I enjoyed this. It's been way too long since I built an engine. Moving on to our timing set itself. We have the Summit Racing Performance Timing Set. Here's your part number right there. This is a double roller timing set that has a ton of adjustability built into it, which is awesome. Here's our double roller chain. Our upper sprocket's already on. But this guy right here is the key. This sucker has eight positions for cam timing. We have straight up, advanced two, four, six, eight degrees, and of course, retard two, four, six, eight degrees. 
Cam timing is very important because it controls your dynamic compression as well as the literal event timing of your valves moving in your cylinders. Retarded cam timing or a loose timing chain which results in retarded cam timing will make your engine a complete dog. Advancing it too far may run a valve into a piston or just even move the cam out of its efficient range. To properly do this, you need a set of tools and a very specific method to do this. I'm not gonna talk about it in today's video. Thunderhead 289 has an excellent video up here, and I mean an excellent video about doing cam timing. If you wanna learn more about that, click up there. Today, I'm going to be running this two degrees advanced so that when our timing chain wears in in the first couple thousand miles, this actually turns out to be straight up and down at zero degrees or neutral cam timing. Of course, doing this, I wanna be very careful and roll the engine over once all the valve lash and everything is set. Following comp cam, very specific instructions right here. Read through this whole thing. I cannot stress this enough. Read your entire instruction manual two or three times. Watch some videos, read this again. And then go ahead and put your cam in your engine. But once everything's lashed and set, I'm gonna turn it over really slow and make sure all our valves and everything clear just fine. So that being said, I'm gonna put the camera down and focus on this for a little while so I don't screw it up. And we'll be back when this is all set. All right, valve train is all cleaned up. I verified our push rod length to make sure our valve preload is correct. Yeah, it's a little tight, but eh, it'll be okay. If the pressure washer didn't make it apparent earlier on, this is not an engine rebuild. This is simply an above and beyond cam swap. Like this is right here is the reason that the engine's even out of the car. Of course, while I'm in here, I wanted to clean everything up and regasket everything while I could. This engine's still gonna have a lot of blow by and probably burn a bit of oil because the rings and the cylinders don't look great. Half of the valve seals are broken and flapping around. We're just trying to make a cheap budget four barrel carb swap for this car. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, our cam swap is done. Let's give her a couple of rotations here. Make sure everything's happy. Sure seems like it. All right, so. How do you make a used intake look good? Here's what I found to work best. If you have a non-polished intake like I do here, step one, have it sandblasted. You're gonna wanna plug anything with threads in it, take it down to the local powder coat or sandblasting shop, have them sandblast it. If you have the stuff to do it yourself, go ahead. Otherwise, you can get some stuff from Harbor Freight pretty cheap. Moral of the story, get it to this finish. Now, from here is where the trick comes in because you can paint this silver but it's just gonna look really silver. And when fuel inevitably drips on that silver paint, it's going to strip it down to this kind of white finish once again. The trick I figured out years ago is to go get some clear. Get some gloss clear or some satin clear, I like gloss, and spray it with just that. Look at that. Boom, and that's that's perfect. That You can't even tell that I've ever sandblasted this intake or anything, because that's pretty much the stock color of an intake. One of the best parts about this, besides the great factory look, is that when it gets gas on it, it doesn't make it super evident. If you get a lot on it and it strips that layer off, you can still kind of tell, but it's not removing paint. It's just exposing more metal that's had this cured into it. There we go. Let that sucker dry. It'll lose a little bit of its sheen. And we'll color good. All right, our timing cover's on. Harmonic balancer is on. Remember, when you put your timing cover on, do not tighten anything down until you take that harmonic balancer and make sure that seal and the timing cover is perfectly centered so that when this goes in, not one side of that seal is more loaded than the other. Move that timing cover around until it's centered on this guy and then bolt it down. This gasket, just like this one, double sided with RTV. And now we just take all this and line her up and stick her together, put RTV on the bolts that go into the block right here and right here so that they do not leak. All right, our timing cover is all done. I wanna talk about something as I'm putting this intake on here. Obviously, once again, double side RTV the gaskets, get them in place, everything's pretty normal. Since we are running an aluminum intake on this engine and only really plan to drive this car in the summer, we don't need this exhaust crossover. There's a crossover right here that breathes off the back of the exhaust valves and crosses exhaust gas from one side to the other to make the base of your carburetor hotter to get your carb up to temp quicker in colder conditions and make it a little more consistent when it's in an OEM configuration. Obviously, not an OEM configuration anymore, so we wanna block that off. 
grab a beer can, cut out a piece of aluminum, grab your intake gasket, lay it on the back, trace that shape out, and then cut them out and RTV him in place. The point of all this, by the way, is to help prevent the fuel from sitting here and boiling on really hot days where the carburetor just gets way hotter than it needs to. So I'll get the second one cut out, put in place, and we'll keep moving. We're now about to do the piece people have the most trouble with getting sealing, and that is the intake, specifically this front and rear china wall. Take the gaskets, even if they're Felpro, we'll take the gaskets that come in your kit and throw them in the trash can. You get a fresh stick of black RTV, the nice soft 90 minute stuff, and lay a half inch tall bead across both of them. Remember we've got RTV on the back of these, I've got RTV on the face of this so I don't make a big mess on this motor. I'll simply drop this intake right into place on that China wall RTV, there we go. When some squishes out, you take your finger and you go like this. And this is a lot, but you seal the intake to the block as if it's a bead of weld. That will not leak. I'm gonna sit here for a bit and get this all sealed up, get that intake torque down, very specifically in the torque pattern that it is supposed to have, and then we'll be good to go. Well, this could be going better. <laughs> If you'll notice, in this area, I have taken off a component that was previously installed. And the reason is, I was going to drop our new Petronix distributor in, so I put my finger over the spark plug hole and noticed something interesting with the tape still on the exhaust valves. Watch this. Remember, there's no valve train being actuated because there's no rocket right now. Just observe for a second. Okay, well, that's great. There's number... Oh, well, there's those two. Yeah, all of those exhaust valves leak. But here's the thing. This ran before, we're out of time, and I don't want to take all that RTV off. We're just going to stick this together and see how well it runs now. Maybe it'll run bad better? I don't know. Now that we've decided to ignore our burnt valves, we can drop in our beautiful Petronix Flamethrower Distributor. This is a Flamethrower 2. Uh, the Flamethrower 3 is obviously top of the line. It's got rev limiters, stuff like that. Regardless, Flamethrower's entire line of distributors is very well made, and these are probably the ones I trust the most out of any brand and design. Just like all the other goodies, we got this sucker from SummitRacing.com. All right, after a week of meticulously cleaning and wire wheeling and painting and reassembling a motor, we finally have ourselves a bright blue Equally worn out as it was before, 318 that now has a four barrel and a camshaft. Our goals were to make it look better, which we certainly achieved, and hopefully make a couple more horsepower. <coughs> ah, yes, the Mopar squeal. That means it's in place. <laughs> Even if it doesn't make a bunch more power, that already looks way better. Now for the moment of truth. Did I screw up and not put the headers on the engine before it went in? Or should have I shuffled these in while the motor was being dropped in? I don't know, but I know one way to find out. The hard way. These are some Summit Racing 1 and 5 8 inch primaries with a 3 inch collector. These were a very budget friendly header that had a very cheap paint job that is basically just to keep it from rusting while it ships. To fix that I sent this down to Phoenix at Phoenix's Powder Coating and he gave us a Cerakote coating on these and these will stay nice and black for a very long time. That being said, oh god. Boy. Hmm. Well, we got our headers up in here. It was a nightmare. I've never had to do this before, but in classic Mopar fashion, you have to remove the center link for your steering because he actually goes through that header. <laughs> this wasn't too bad to take out, really. And even more so an issue, this whole shift linkage is supposed to sit like right about there, and it can't. So I gotta cut and modify this. Other than that, they go right into place just fine and they look great in there. So let's get those bolted up, put some parts on this motor and fire it. All right, so it's been at least a full day. Radiators on, hoses are on, belts on, fans on, carburetors on, Petronix ignition is in place. Mufflers are even on the end of our Summit Racing headers. This sucker is ready to go. It should be pretty much dialed in right now. I ran the electric fuel pump for a couple seconds. We've got fuel. I'm gonna turn this switch on over here and hit this and see if it fires off, see if we're close enough to push it outside and do our cam break in. Oh, hell yeah. Perfect. Oh, it sounds good. 
All right, I got my timing light, the garden hose to keep the engine cool when it inevitably overheats, a tachometer, an oil pressure gauge, a water gauge. We got 1040 with a bunch of zinc in it. Everything should be good to go. For once, please, on this whole build, don't do Mopar things and just stay together. It is a true comp cam, so they, they're pretty damn good. But no, oh, it's no less nerve wracking. that issue. Ooh, that's not great for it. Let's see how fast I can get that fixed. Ideally you don't want to shut your engine down in the middle of a cam break-in. The whole idea is to get the cam warm and have oil splashing on it, which is what the RPM is for. But 230 degrees changes a few things. I don't know if it's actually a thermostat so much as it is a bunch of air in the system. I opened this and a bunch of cold water came out and then bubbles and then warm water. So we'll try that. Let's see what that does. Folks, we have ourselves a running, ready to rock and roll drive line in the satellite. This sucker sounds great. It runs excellent. It's got good vitals. It's surprisingly much more healthy than I anticipated it being for seeing how dirty and worn out the inside of that motor was. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and I hope you subscribe, leave a comment below, and leave a like as well as sharing the video. We'll see you next time for part three on the satellite where we tackle wheels, tires, interior, and everything else that is left to put this sucker back on the road for the first time and literally no one knows how many years as well as hopefully tracking down even more of the story of the satellite by the way if anyone has any taillight housings that will fit this car i don't need the lenses i don't need the bumper i need the actual back piece the housing that holds the bulbs let me know junkyarddigs1 at gmail.com we'll see you next time peace you know what hang on one more time for the ladies I can't wait to hear it with a real exhaust. That ain't bad.
head for a bludgeon 318. 